But we start with the live question of the week. Is the financial regulator going soft on the banks? In her first interview since those claims were made, the acting head of the Financial Conduct Authority, Tracy McDermott, hits back. No, she says, it's not true. You'll hear that interview shortly. She was responding to criticisms over the new year that since Chief Executive Martin Wheatley was effectively dismissed last summer by George Osborne, the regulators got too cosy with financial firms, especially the banks. Bob Howard's been looking at the controversy over where the regulator is heading. Headlines published in the last few months have been highly critical of recent decisions by the Financial Conduct Authority. The most controversial was the decision to scrap its investigation into banking culture, pay and behaviour. Then there's the decision not to publish a report on how firms offer inducements to sales staff, nor to take formal action against HSBC following revelations that its Swiss arm helped clients to evade tax. The things that are happening aren't proving popular in some quarters either. The FCA is consulting on whether to impose a time limit beyond which customers could no longer put in a PPI claim. An expert panel it set up is considering whether to allow commission-based selling of investment products again. And some commentators are alarmed by Santander's decision to have more than 200 investment advisers back selling products in branches by the end of March. Santander was fined £12 million by the regulator in 2014 for investment advice failings. Peter Hamilton is a barrister whose cases involve the financial services market and FCA regulation. He believes the FCA has softened its stance since Martin Wheatley, the last permanent head of the regulator, was forced to step down. Let's look at all the evidence. The abandonment by the FCA of its review of banks, culture and ethos. The decision not to take action against HSBC in respect of its Swiss subsidiary. The fact that actually now Santander have uh, decided to come back into the advisory market, having been fined a substantial sum of money for its failures in that market, which tends to suggest that they are feeling more confident about the way in which they may be regulated. How soon do you think consumers would notice a difference? I think they'd notice quite quickly. For example, if the banks do roll out a financial advisory service, the consumers walking into those banks are going to be faced with what used to happen, namely you walk in to cash a cheque and somebody sidles up to you and says, have you thought about life insurance? Have you thought about your ISA allowance for the year? The evidence tend, I think, to support the view that the FCA are going back to a lighter touch as far as the banks are concerned. That's a trend which is likely to alarm MPs sitting on the influential Treasury Select Committee. Mark Garnier is one. It's a very, very difficult tightrope to walk. You've got to keep two sets of people happy. On the one hand, you've got your members, you've got your customers, who are the ones who are paying for your your upkeep and they're paying for the, the, the membership fees, and those are the people you are regulating. The Treasury was seeing them as being too hard on the banks, whereas you know, in the Treasury Select Committee or, and in Parliament, we probably thought they were being too hard on consumers. So we have to make sure that we don't create an impossible environment for the new chief executive, who ultimately will just go into a job that they are set to fail at. Victoria Raffa has spent 20 years as a regulator and was on the Financial Conduct Authority's executive committee until a year ago. She firmly rejects suggestions that her former employer is being heavily influenced behind the scenes. I don't think that's how regulation works. I think it's a misreading of how regulation works and regulators work. I don't believe you can take individual things, add them up and say this means that the FCA is spineless or supine or lacking in authority. I don't believe that for one moment. Do you think in any way it's not the confidence of people to make bold decisions? It's inevitable that Martin's departure will have knocked confidence amongst some people. But people who've been at regulators for a long time, we've sort of seen this sort of thing before. The negative impact is more on more junior staff who obviously want to be working for something that is well regarded. They want to be proud of what they do. They are deeply committed to what they're doing and would like everybody to recognise that. But Mark Garnier says that pressure can sometimes be subtle and he wants to find out more about what impact it may have had on the FCA 
when its acting head Tracy McDermott appears before his committee. Influence can be, you know, overt influence, if you like, where you know, potentially you could have the chance of the, or any chance of the Exchequer phoning up any chief executive of the regulator and saying you must do this and then, and then bending to that. And then there, there is kind of, if you like, implicit or assumed interference. And that is when you get a situation where the next chief executive may feel that they have to do what they think is the will of the Treasury and thereby being influenced, if you like, subliminally. What sort of pitch do you think candidates will be making to the Treasury in the current climate? And Well, I sincerely hope it's not along the lines of tell me what you want to do and I will be your obedient servant. Mark Garnier, MP, ending that report from Bob Howard. Well, after that bruising week, the FCA's acting head, Tracy McDermott, agreed to speak exclusively to Moneybox. I asked her first of all about George Osborne announcing on Radio 4 on Thursday that she didn't want to be the FCA's permanent chief executive. It was very much a personal decision. At this point in my career, I didn't think it was the right role for me. I think it's time for me to think about what I want to do in the future. So it's a personal decision. How difficult has it been making tough decisions when there hasn't been a full-time chief executive? How difficult has it been for you? It hasn't been particularly difficult. I don't think that the financial world stands still whilst the FCA looks for a new chief executive. And the FCA has had a chief executive. It's had me. Um, it simply hasn't had a permanent chief executive. So the types of decisions we have been making are the decisions we think are the right ones for the financial services sector. But you have walked away from things that might have made those markets more effective, haven't you? You've decided not to carry on with the review into the culture of banks. You've decided not to do that. Why? Well, I very much welcome the opportunity actually to, to set the record um, straight on this because there's been a lot of press coverage about this in the last few days. We started that work earlier in the year. We reviewed whether or not doing this through a thematic review was the right way to go. And what we concluded on the basis of the initial work we had done was that actually this was something which was very much more individually firm specific. So we decided that we should take that forward through individual work with particular firms. So we have not let up our focus on culture at all. We have simply decided that this is not the best way to achieve the objective. But you said it would look at remuneration, appraisal and promotion decisions of middle management. Those are the very areas, aren't they, where the banks have failed in terms of rigging the LIBOR rate and fixing foreign exchange rates. Surely that is something you should be looking at and telling us, the public, what's gone wrong. We are looking at that, but we are looking at it on an individual But you're not going to tell basis. us what you find. And, and the second point is that where we find that there are poor practice in areas such as remuneration, we do call that out, and we call that out in things like our final notices in relation to LIBOR and FX. We called it out in our final notice in relation to the Barclays fine in December around the, the fact that the remuneration from the client was a part of the fact that led them to go around their own systems controls. We called out in our wealth management thematic review that we published earlier in the year, that it was a, an area that we had looked at in terms of culture. You are supposed to be independent, but th the criticism that's made is that you're following the government line, you're softening the approach to banks. You know, the Chancellor has cut the bank levy, he's called a new settlement with the banks, and now it seems that the FCA is following this, basically saying, you go ahead, make money as you choose, we'll have a word with you, but we're not going to do much in public about it. Nothing could be further from the... From, from the truth. So we you're not following the government line? We are not going soft on the banks. We are not being told what to do by the government. We have objectives which are set for us by Parliament in statute and we are determined to deliver on those. And if you look at what we have been doing over the past six months whilst I've been in the role as Chief Executive, you will see that we have continued to take action against the industry, both in terms of penalties on firms and in terms of penalties on individuals. Absolutely delivering the right outcomes for consumers in financial markets. So when the Treasury Select Committee tells us they're concerned that the Treasury is influencing you and that you and the Treasury are going back to a, a lighter touch regulation, you're saying that's not true? The reality is that we make our decisions about what we think is going to be the most effective way to achieve the outcomes that we are looking to achieve and that includes holding the banks to account where we need to. Is it true that you've decided to take no action against HSBC following the Swiss leaks about um, the collusion by its staff in tax evasion by some of its customers? Um, we don't comment on individual firm specific decisions. So you can't say whether you've decided to take any action or not to take any action? 
we don't comment on individual firm specific decisions. Another study you announced in the business plan was about inducements and conflicts of interest, wasn't it? What happened to that? We have concluded that work. We fed back to the firms concerned. We looked at whether we should issue guidance off the back of that thematic review, but there is European legislation coming into force shortly which will have guidance on inducements. So rather than issuing two pieces of guidance in quick succession on the same topic, we are going to issue guidance rolled up in relation to MIFID. Does it worry you that just after you announced you weren't going to publish this at the moment, a major high street bank, Santander, which you've already fined for the way it dealt with investment advice, is going to put back 225 sales staff in its branches selling investments. No, I don't think the two things are, are connected. Obviously, there. Well, they came been... one after the other. That doesn't mean they're connected. The fact that things come one after the other doesn't necessarily imply there's a link between it. The work we did was focused on, on the IFA sector. One of the things, again, which you and, and your listeners will be well aware of is that there has been a lot of retrenchment in the advice sector with a lot of banks withdrawing from the mass market advice sector. And part of the reason for that was absolutely because we as the regulator had said we didn't think that they were meeting the standards that were required. So Santander, along with others, had withdrawn from from that market. They've now changed their processes, improved their procedures, and they are re-entering that market. And I think it's, it's good for consumers that people re-enter the market provided they do it properly. And we will obviously be looking at how that develops. So it doesn't worry you that high street banks might be putting out advisors back into their branches, something they've had to withdraw from because of your criticisms? It doesn't worry me that people are going to start making advice and guidance available to But it's not, it's sales, isn't it? Provided that they do that in a way which is compliant with our rules. How do you react to reports this week that the Financial Advice Market Review has an expert panel and it's considering recommending the return of commission sales, something that the FCA banned under the Retail Distribution Review? We have got 290 responses to the um, financial advice markets review from all sorts of bodies, including consumer bodies, and we'll be looking at those carefully over the course of the next month or so. So your mind is still open as to whether there should be the opportunity for commission to be earned selling investment products? We do not want to go back to a world where we have the problems of the pre-retail distribution review. What we do want to look at is actually what is the best way of delivering advice and guidance across the, across the market. So I wouldn't rule out that there may be some element of commission, but we are not going to reverse the retail distribution review. So you wouldn't rule out an element of commission in future sales of investment products? We would need to look at um, whether or not that was one of the options that's been put forward. Tracy McDermott. Santander has told Moneybox that its 225 financial planning managers will earn bonuses, but there's no link to sales in the assessment of that reward.